It is now recording. Okay, so first thing we need to do, first thing we need to do is we need to review, we need to review cell membranes. And so it's been a while and I need somebody to remind me of the major components of cell membranes. What are the major components of a cell membrane? What's there? What isn't there? Yeah. How do they work? Well, Kyle. Phospholipids. Phospholipids. And, and, and how do they, you polar and nonpolar? And how are they oriented? Tori. Okay, so we've got an outer layer of phospholipids. Yes? Yes? And we've got an inner layer of phospholipids. Just like that. And they are oriented like this. And why are they oriented this way? Trinity, here, I'll let, what were you going to say, Trinity? Nothing to answer. No, 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 that's fine. I was going to say there's proteins. There are proteins. And where are there proteins? There are proteins that extend through the membrane. And what do we call those? Transmembrane proteins that extend through. Some of these are channels. Okay, right? And then we've got proteins that are attached to phospholipids, right? Yeah. All right, Tori, are you going to answer the question that I asked? Oh, can you ask it one more time? Why are the phospholipids oriented this way? Um, because... Are these tails polar or nonpolar? Non-polar. Non-polar. The, the, the heads are polar. So what's outside of the cell? What's the major solvent outside of the cell? It is fluid. Well, the fluid mosaic model is a model of the membrane, but what's the major solvent outside of the cell? What's the major solvent in all living... Yeah, there we go, in all living environments. So we've got water out here as the major solvent. What is the major solvent inside of the cell? Here, let me write outside so that we know what's going on. And then, so this would, of course, be the inside. Okay? And so we've got water as the major solvent outside of the cell. But what about inside of the cell? Cholesterol. <laughs> water. Still water. I'm just There's cholesterol. <laughs> There's cholesterol within the membrane. See? Yeah. Okay. Straight cholesterol. All right. So, is water polar or nonpolar? Polar. 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 So the heads of the phospholipids can interact with water because they are polar and water is polar, but the tails are nonpolar, and nonpolar materials do not interact with water, right? So the phospholipids bilayer actually they self-assemble bilayers when you place them in water to be able to keep these nonpolar tails from having to interact with water. It's beautiful. Oh, it's wonderful. It's beautiful. It is somewhat it is water it's water repellent. It's not waterproof. It is water repellent. You know what is waterproof? What is? So uh, parasites specifically uh, intestinal roundworms, they have a layer in their eggs of a specific type of lipid that is waterproof. So water cannot penetrate their eggs. And so it makes their eggs incredibly resilient and they can literally survive for decades in the soil. The, the egg of this parasite. In your stomach too. But you can, so if, if you have... I, let's think about an intestinal roundworm. I know this is just a game we're playing for a minute. So an intestinal roundworm, when it lays eggs, where do those eggs go? In the stomach. Well, they, they're, they're, they're in the intestines. So if it lays eggs, what happens to material in the intestines if they aren't fighting their way out? It flushes out. And so most of these parasites have what we call fecal-oral transmission routes. Don't love that. Okay? So you end up having to eat something that is contaminated with these eggs. Okay? And then the way that these eggs get out is in the feces. All right? So let's just think for a minute. You are fertilizing the field with feces, right? Because it's nitrogen rich, right? In the same way the whale feces 
uh, enriched that environment and, and led to blooms of producers, right? You had that on, on yeah. your last exam. And so, you, you know, you're, you're fertilizing these crops with feces. And then think about it, that, that feces may be contaminated with parasite eggs that can survive for literally decades in that area. And then you think about like fecal oral transmission and it's like it's no wonder that it is incredibly difficult to eradicate intestinal parasites. Because wow. it's just, their eggs are everywhere. It's like pinworms when you go into a daycare. I'm sorry, that's another story for another time. All right. So, going back to this idea, they assemble this way to keep the nonpolar tails from having to interact with water. It does make this an incredibly water resistant structure. It is not waterproof. Water can move through the membrane, but it is water resistant. All right? Okay, so here's a transmembrane protein. We've got some peripheral proteins. We do have some cholesterol in there. Is that what you're going to get at? So cholesterol looks a little bit like a phospholipid, but it's a lot smaller. So cholesterol has a polar, uh, it's not really like a head with the tail, it's, it's more of a complex, big, bulky structure, but there's a polar end and a non-polar end. And why is there cholesterol in there? What does cholesterol do? It is a lipid. It takes up space. It does take up space, but that's not why it's there. There's plenty of things that could take up space that you can put in there. Emma. It prevents solidifying. Yeah, it keeps the membrane from t becoming solid at low temperatures, and it keeps it from melting at high temperatures. And so the cholesterol stabilizes the membrane. Okay? Keeps it from solidifying at low temperatures, and it keeps it from melting at high temperatures. What happens if a membrane melts? That's bad news, right? The cell contents just leak everywhere. It's just, it's not good. It's one of the reasons why it's incredibly difficult to bring something dead back to life. Because once something dies and, homeos and uh, equilibrium is reached, the cells start to leak their contents. Okay? And it's just, it's really difficult to, to reverse good that. Good morning! Good morning! Welcome back, everyone! Okay. All right, so melting membranes, that's not good. What happens if the membranes solidify? Nothing. Oh, nothing. That's, that's not good either. They become very brittle, yeah, they okay, and then they can break, and again, you're going to leak cell contents. That's still not good. And so cholesterol is in there. This right here, this is Kyle's cholesterol. Kyle's <laughs> cholesterol. <laughs> okay. No, he didn't. K I A L. Thank you. No, no, that's not how you spell his. I've seen his name spelled many times. He yeah. wrote his own name on my thing that they gave me, thanking me for coaching. Okay, so unless he spelled his own name wrong, it's Kyle. But that's in the question. I like to spell Rick's name R I C H, because it's short for Richard, of course. All right. So this is this is cholesterol stabilizing this member. All right. So now what I need you to do is this, okay? I need you, okay, working in groups. I don't, I don't really care how big the groups are. It's probably going to end up with four groups because that's what happens anyways. I want you to take one of these four mechanisms, okay? Either simple diffusion or facilitated diffusion or active transport or endocytosis plus exocytosis. We're putting that as a single mechanism. And I want you to show me, using a membrane, which direction is that material going to flow, and how does it happen? Oh, like against the gradient. Yes. Is it against the gradient? Is it with the gradient? And then I want you to tell me, does it require energy? Does it not require energy? Okay. And rather than actually just picking one of these, I want you to do all four of these in your groups, okay? So get into some groups, take each of these four mechanisms. I want you to show me using a membrane, hint, draw a membrane, and I want you to show me which direction the material is going to flow, how does it flow, and does it require energy or not require energy, all right? All right. You draw it. You're going to be mad at me.
I'm undivided, but I don't know if that's possible. Can, may I have your may I have your divided attention? Sure. Okay, so simple diffusion. Look at oh here. Let me use a different color marker. This is going to be pretty slick. Okay, so simple diffusion doesn't require energy. No, it does not. And this one moves with the gradient. Okay, so simple diffusion. We're going to mark this as blue. And so let's say we've got two sodium ions on this side, and on this side we've got five sodium ions. Nope. <laughs> no, never. You have to write every single one. Okay, which is more, five or two? Five. five. Oh man, that is so good. Okay, so there is more sodium on this side than there is on this side, and so it's going to want to move down its concentration gradient. This is simple diffusion. Oh, this was not a good example for simple diffusion. So let's save this one. Here, let's do this. This is facilitated diffusion because sodium cannot move freely through the membrane because it's charged and it cannot interact with these nonpolar. So it'll move through the membrane, but it'll go through this ion channel. I mean, that's just beautiful, right? So now let's go to green and let's do simple diffusion. <laughs> How about, how about we do simple diffusion? Okay, and so we've got glucose outside, and let's say we've got glucose times eight yes. on the outside. On the inside, we've got glucose times two. Okay, and we don't wanna do more because what you'll find out starting on Thursday is there is always very little glucose inside the cell because once glucose ends up inside of the cell It is immediately converted into glucose 6 phosphate. Yeah, okay, so aren't they doing this because like they kind of want to get balanced, right? Uh, well, that's just the shh. But like, So Rick so asked a question two, aren't they doing this because they want to get balanced? The the thing is is it does they, they don't desire anything just materials move to a higher state of randomness. And where they maximize randomness is where there is maximum amount of space for them. Okay, and that's gonna require them to move down their concentration gradient. Okay. Yeah, because you're like five and two, they're never gonna get balanced. Yeah. Th you don't, things don't get balanced. Because when things, things get balanced, it means the cell's probably dead. Oh. And if there's, you're reaching equilibrium on either side, th things should not be balanced. Okay, in living organisms, things should not be balanced, at least chemically. All right, so glucose is going to move by simple diffusion across the membrane uh, into uh, the inner space. Okay, and even glucose, glucose is probably not the greatest example to use for simple diffusion either because it's pretty big and a lot of times it is facilitated. But hey, you know, what are you going to do? We, we did simple diffusion. And, and I, I guess you could do water, but then we call water when it moves by simple diffusion. Osmosis. Osmosis. You could do something small and nonpolar, but I did glucose. Yeah. So facilitated diffusion requires energy? Facilitated diffusion does not require just energy. Ju just something for it to move through. Yep. So neither of these require energy. So let's write that. No energy. Required, yeah, no energy required. Now, what about active transport? The key word here is active, okay? Active requires energy. I'm gonna do that with all caps. I wanna emphasize this, yeah. It requires energy. And for active transport, let's see, does this red one work? Oh yeah, okay. So we've got red for our active transport. And now we're going to move something against its concentration gradient, okay? So we're actually pumping something against the current, like the salmon pumping themselves against the current of a river, right? Right into the wading mouth of a grizzly bear, all right? So let's do this. Look at this. Look, at, look, look, look just for a moment. We're going to do a pump here. This right here is a pump, and it is going to pump sodium against its concentration gradient. Okay? 
there's sodium there times one, there's sodium here times three. You're like, hey, but we already had five sodium there. Listen, we're just illustrating the same processes on the same membrane. The conditions don't have to be exactly the same. Just relax, okay? So active transport, they like to have friends. Um, they don't like to have friends, but their parents are forcing them uh, to interact. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, man. Oh man, I was gonna say I was gonna say something mean, but no, no. Say it to my face. Never. Oh man, that reminded me of Brave. Have you seen that movie? Unfortunately. Unfortunately, that's a good movie. All right. Endocytosis, exocytosis. Do these require energy? No. You bet they do. These also require energy. These require a great deal of energy because what you do, and, and this was the illustration where Issa and I had this, this conversation about going to a Dodger game, and it would, and you remember this illustration, and I said, it would be like something wrapped around you, part of Santa Clarita wrapped around you here, and then shuttled you over to Dodger Stadium fused with oh, yeah. Dr. Oh, Stadium yeah. and released you there, right? That would be pretty cool. It would be awesome. <laughs> and so the actual fusion, the actual fusion does not require energy. If you put a little cell, a little cell with a little membrane next to a big cell with a big membrane, the little cell has a pretty good chance of fusing with that larger cell. Okay? That doesn't require energy. It's it's transporting the vesicle that requires energy. Okay? And so endocytosis and, and exocytosis, I'm not going to illustrate on this membrane. I'm going to draw a new membrane. You ready? Okay. And this one, I'm, I'm going to draw it a little bit simpler. Okay. There's our membrane. Can you see it? Can you picture it? Can you smell it? Yeah, I can, I can taste it. I feel like these are odor free, low odor. Okay. All right, so here's our membrane. And in endocytosis, check this out. It's like, hey, there's some material here that the cell wants in. Okay? There's some material that the cell wants in, so check this out. The cell will actually grow around. This material, oh, it's too and so it, I, I drew it dashed because it's on the move. I want you to, I want you to see that dynamism, okay? That dynamic nature, okay? It's on the move. What's that? Like you when you jump the pillar thing at Walmart. Oh yeah, dude! I was totally on the move, and the guy's mouth fell open. Because he'd never seen a big guy move like that. And I know what he was thinking because he looked pretty athletic. He'd be like, man, you must have been a really great offensive lineman when you played football. And I was. You know? <laughs> Just incredible. All right. And so this, this cell will move around and it'll keep moving until it forms a vesicle. So here I need to draw a, the next step. And the next step is now there's a vesicle inside the cell with all of that material in it. It like eats it. Yeah. So where does, where does the extra stuff to surround it come from? The extra stuff to surround what? It stretches. Oh, the membrane? It stretches. Yeah, it stretches. You bet. Yeah, the, the membrane. Remember the what is our dominant model for how a membrane works? Do you remember the name? Somebody said it already today. Mosaic something. Fluid mosaic, mosaic model. Okay, it's a, it's a fluid, okay? And fluids typically have a constant volume, but a flexible shape, okay? Okay, all right. And then what you'll see is sometimes this portion of the cell will shrink to allow for it to stretch in that place. Yeah, okay, Emma. So um, where the dotted line is, like the lower portion of it? Yeah, right here? So yeah. Like, once it covers, well, like the, it'd be like this, and then like this is probably like open up, like you know what I'm saying? Like. Well, once like, these come infuse, yeah, it's like trapped in that one portion. Right? It's like, well, well, you have to think about it here. Okay. Shh. So Emma asked a good question. So on this side, we have how many layers? 
It's a bilayer. <laughs> so right here we have two layers, right? Right here we have two layers. Right here we have two layers. Right here we have two layers. At the point at which they fuse, how many layers do you have? Two. Four. Right? When they fuse together, we've got two here, two here, two here, two here. At the point at which they fuse together, you've got four layers, two separate membranes. Okay? So at the point, it basically pinches off a portion of the membrane. All right, and then this would be shuttled to a place in the cell where it could digest whatever that is or process it. What kind of organelle functions to digest or metabolize things? Oh, oh. the lysosome. Yeah. Oh, right. Like puts, it like makes it yeah, it. buddy. All right, and so exocytosis works the same way, but in reverse. Okay, to where you have this vesicle, and then it goes and fuses with the membrane and releases its contents. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it is really cool. We should make a cell like that. <laughs> <laughs> that. And so, uh, pH. Oh, what was? Oh, yeah. So I, I got an awkward question from my five-year-old. <laughs> no, it what? No, that's not an awkward question. That's it's just a, a silly question. Um, it's irrelevant because wetness is something your brain interprets. It's not an actual physical quality. Yeah, it's it's not not All right, anyways, no. So my son, he's like, how do animals make milk? Right? And so I'm like, I mean, it was a good question, but I'm like, where do I want to go with this? He actually, it started with, um, oh, so right after my daughter was, when I told you she cried and she said she wanted to move to Alaska because it snows there. Uh, I don't know, maybe the next day she's like, you know what, I want to move to a farm so we can have animals, right? And she's just, she's a dreamer, right? And so, and uh, she's like, I want to have a cow so I can milk a cow. And then she's like, she knows my wife, my wife grew up in acting and she did 4-H and like she milked animals. And she's like, mommy, is it fun to milk a cow? And my wife's like, no, not really. Um, and, then, and then so our son was like, how do animals make milk? Right? And so like, I didn't know, I didn't know how to answer this. I'm like, are we, are, are, am I going to get into like, the changes that happen as a female reaches adulthood, right? And she, so then I just, I, I answered it using exocytosis. I'm like, well, you've got these gland cells. gets it. He's like, oh, okay. You've got these cells that line these glands, and they empty their contents into a cavity, and then the walls of the cavity contract and force that fluid out. Wow. Yeah. And well, uh, he didn't ask any more questions. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So does this all make sense? Yeah. We, we good? It doesn't make sense? So this is, this is our review of chapter seven. And we're just under, I think, halfway done. Oh, no, we're just over halfway done with our time. And we've reviewed chapter seven. And all we have left to do is review chapter eight. It's wonderful. Yeah, Tori. Okay. So the circle thing with the other circle inside of it, that goes inside of the... This right here? Yeah. Yeah, so following this, you're talking about like following the endocytic event? Well, so that goes inside of that, and then... Well, so exocytosis, it's the reverse process. You take a vesicle, you transport it out to the outer membrane. Okay. As it fuses with that membrane, it releases its contents. Again, it would, it would be, so let's go back to our story, right? I want to get to Dodger Stadium. A piece of Santa Clarita wraps around me, <laughs> right? And then, and, uh, no, a piece of, a piece of Santa Clarita. Right, because, I mean, it, you would have to have some kind of a wall around the city that was selectively permeable, right, for the illustration to work well. And a piece of it actually wraps around me and then transports me to Dodger Stadium where I fuse with the membrane of Dodger Stadium and then get released into the inside. Yeah, it, it, yeah, it, 
Yeah, <laughs> exocytosis would probably be the best uh, illustration of what's happening there. And then I'd have to be endocytosed here by Santa Clarita. Yeah. Um, yeah. Endocytosis. Yeah, so fa have you heard of uh, phagocytosis? I'm sure you, you probably don't remember because uh, information has a half-life. But I know you've you've learned phagocytosis. This specifically is phagocytosis. It means cell eating, <laughs> cell eating. Uh, but it's a type of endocytosis, and it's usually receptor mediated. But that's more than you need to know. Another cell. What does it eat? It can eat another cell. It can eat just loose material in it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're cells are eating. Oh, we got a dog on Saturday. And uh, it's the first time my wife and I have owned a dog as a couple. We both had dogs growing up. I always had a dog growing up. She always had a dog growing up, but we've never had a dog as a couple. But we got a dog, and I'm transporting it from where we adopted it to my house. And there were fries all over the floor in the backseat of my car that I was unaware of because my kids put them there. And the dog just ate the fries all the way home. And my daughter, my daughter was with us, my oldest daughter, and she didn't say anything until we got home. And she's like, oh, dad, zero is eating fries off your floor. Zero. Zero. And I was like, what? Oh, zero? Well, it's also the dog from Nightmare Before Christmas. Uh, he's a poodle mix. <gasps> Sorry. My poodle mix too. Yeah, he's probably... They, they marketed him as a Shih Tzu Poodle mix, but I don't think he is. I, I think he's actually so skeptical. He is, he's, yeah, he's two years old. He's, he's, a, I'd say he's about 20 pounds. He's, he's a, he only stands to like here. Oh, that's Yeah. But he's a perfect size for my kids because they're small and, you know. All right. So any questions from chapter seven? Okay, so we're going to take a short break. There's nothing I can... All right. So we are live. No. And so we need to review chapter eight. We've already reviewed chapter seven. You loved it. Everything came back to you better than riding a bike. Because you're like, wow, this tastes so much better than the asphalt when you're trying to relearn how to ride a bike. All right. So thermodynamics. Big thing about thermodynamics is the ability to look at a graph and to tell what's going on. Okay, so on the y-axis, we are going to have energy. And you can measure energy in anything. We'll do energy in joules. I mean, you can't measure energy in anything, right? But there are several different yes. units that you can use to measure energy. Yeah, measure in anything. That's what I just said. Well, first I said you can measure energy in anything. Oh, yeah. But I wanted to clarify that is not true. You cannot... Measure energy and energy. Okay. What goes on the x-axis? Time. Time, and we'll do time in seconds. Okay. All right. And let's say we have something like this. All right. How would you describe the thermodynamics of this reaction? More energy is, is being absorbed by the product. Okay, so energy is being absorbed by this reaction. Why would you say that, Rick? Um, With an H? <laughs> Do your parents listen to these recordings? No. Would your mom be offended by how I pick on you? No. Okay. <laughs> She'd be like, you need to you need to hit him a little bit harder. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. okay. So how can we tell that this reaction is absorbing energy, Rick? Okay. Because in the beginning you have the reactives. Yeah, so the reactants would be on this side, absolutely. And the right? Because as, as, as the reaction carries on, you're going to shift from reactants into products, right? That's, right? that's how reactions work. That's how they work. you can't go product to reactant. You know, my daughter asks why all the time, like I did when I was a kid. Why? And sometimes I get to a point where I can't give her a good answer, so I just say that's the way it works. And so now she tells our three-year-old, who's a why asker, all the time, she's just like, that's how it works. Anyways, so this is this is how a reaction works, right? You go from reactants to products, and then, Rick, continue. There's more energy in the products. Yeah, the products have more free energy than the reactants do. So this reaction absorbs energy. 
or requires energy. Now, what would we call this kind of reaction? A cell fuel. We would call this an endothermic, endothermic. reaction. Um, a reaction that requires energy. It absorbs energy. You could call it an endothermic, or you can call it an endergonic <laughs> reaction. And then, you don't have this in your notes? Well, now you've got a new one, right? Okay. I just wrote that. And so, we measure the free energy available in a material using G for Gibbs free energy. Delta G means the change in Gibbs free energy. What's that? Where? Yes, that is a J. J for joules. It's probably the, the, the most common unit for energy is joules. All right, so in this case, delta G is what? Is it positive or is it negative? It's positive. It is positive because, shh, it's positive because there's more free energy in the products of the reaction than there are in the reactants. Is a, is a process with a positive delta G going to be spontaneous? Yeah. That means will it happen without the input of energy? No. No, right? It absorbs energy. It's by definition something that requires energy. It requires energy to happen. Okay? It's pretty good, right? I do that all the time. I call it awake apnea. Was anyone in my class last year in Celtics class? Remember that one time we were reading the Bible and it was all quiet and I just like forgot how to breathe. It made the loudest noise ever and he looked at me so weird. <laughs> Did you feel like a, like a betta fish gasping for air? Yes. When it comes to the surface? And, oh. Yeah. Okay. Are you okay? I have a betta fish, and I know that I'm scared of other betta fish. Like, they fight. Yeah. So, I have like some fish. You know, things fight for more than just out of fear, but well, anyways. Yeah. Okay, well, like, I had a container of food, and had like a betta fish on it, so I put the betta fish, like, I taped onto the tank, and the betta fish jumped out of the water and got stuck in the plant. So it's like out of the water. And that was my animal. Okay. So are we okay here? Yeah. Okay. So this is not a spontaneous reaction. Let's say for a minute the thermodynamics of a reaction look like this. How would you explain the thermodynamics of this reaction? Being released. What's being released? Energy. Energy. So here we have the reactants, right? Because this is how a reaction works. You start with reactants, you end with products. The products have less free energy than the reactants. This is a reaction that releases energy, which we would call exothermic. Exothermic or exergonic? I don't like those other words. And delta G, which is a measurement of the change of free energy, what would it be? Negative. Most likely it would be negative. Okay, if it's releasing energy, most likely it's going to be negative. The only way it could be positive is if this, you're, you're, you're significantly decreasing the amount of disorder. But that would be hard to do while still releasing energy. Okay? All right. That's cool. So here are the reactants. At the very beginning here, here are the products. And so what do we call this amount of energy here? Oh, I got you. Yeah. Activation. The activation energy. Look at you. Oh, shoot. The Okay, now delta G, okay, real quick, I'm going to ask you a very important question. And the answer to this question might be the imp most important answer you've ever given. Okay, you ready? If this is a spontaneous reaction, will it happen in a time scale that is feasible for life? 
spontaneous. Okay, so it's spontaneous. It's going to happen without the input of energy, right? It's going to happen. Is it going to happen in an amount of time that will facilitate life? Probably not. Because of what? Because of this activation energy. So it's spontaneous because the products have less free energy than the reactants, but because of this activation energy, it's probably going to take a significant amount of time for this to happen. Because why do, does it require a little bit of energy? What's this activation energy doing? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's basically creating strain on bonds, right? It's creating strain. And so how do we, even with spontaneous reactions, get these to happen in an amount of time that is conducive for living organisms? Enzymes. enzymes. So what do enzymes do? So here, let me change colors. We're going to do blue. Kyle. Lower the activation. Yeah, so this is activation energy without an enzyme. And look at this. That is enzyme. Okay, so now the, the, the enzyme did what, Kyle? It lowered the activation energy. It lowered the amount of energy that you have to put in in order to get the reaction started. Now this reaction can happen on a scale that is conducive to life. So what, somebody think of, give me an example of a spontaneous reaction. So a reaction that happens in our bodies that is spontaneous. We talked about this before we, before we left. Can anybody remember? We talked about, you know, the energy currency of the cell, ATP, and so the reaction, the hydrolysis of ATP into ADP plus an inorganic phosphate, this is a spontaneous reaction. And this is a spontaneous reaction. However, without enzymes facilitating this, it would take a really, really, really long time. I don't know how long, it depends on the conditions, but with enzymes, your body can do this literally hundreds of millions of time at, at times every second. So what did we say before we, before we broke that every cell makes and breaks about 100 pounds of ATP a day? Something like that. Every cell in your body, about 100 pounds of ATP a day. Do we say a day? A day. Each day. That's pretty cool, right? That's like half of me. Yeah. Okay, so the enzymes lower the activation energy. All right, true or false? True or false? Enzymes are used up by a reaction. That is, they are a reactant. False, right? Enzymes are not a reactant. They can get saturated, but then once that reaction is done, that enzyme is free to catalyze another reaction. The enzymes do not get changed during these reactions. Now, there are other reactions that may change an enzyme, but that's a different reaction altogether. That's not the one the enzyme is facilitating. Okay, true or false? True. Enzymes will facilitate greater energy release. False. False. Enzymes do not change the thermodynamics. The reactants have as much free energy as they do with or without an enzyme working on it. Okay? The reactants have a certain amount of free energy. The products have a certain amount of free energy. The enzymes don't change that. What the enzymes do is lower the activation energy, shorten the amount of time it takes for the reaction to happen. All right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right, got a couple of things that we still need to talk about from chapter eight. First of which is what is one of our models of how enzymes work? So enzymes are substrate specific. That is, they bind to specific materials. And there are two models to explain how that works. One of them, right? lock, and key. lock and key, that the enzyme is shaped in such a way that only a very specific key 
will fit in that enzyme and will trigger the reaction. So that's one model to explain why enzymes are substrate specific. Trinity, what's the other model? Add materials to make it fit, make it fit induce fit. Induced fit. So that the enzymes are not perfectly shaped for the material. They have the perfect chemistry. Do you, are, do you hear this? This is good stuff. They're not perfectly shaped. They have the perfect chemistry to bind to that substrate, and then they change their shape to match that substrate. Induced fit. Okay? Induced fit. Okay. All right. Okay. May I erase this? Yes, ma'am. Okay. I'm going to keep this. Alright. So, I need you to draw this graph. Okay? I don't know why I erased time, because that's still time. No, that's not time. Ha ha! Ha ha! <laughs> this is substrate <laughs> concentration. Wait, this is a new one. This is a new graph. Wait, so we're still doing chapter Yes. We're adding more to chapter Oh yeah. Well, we already reviewed it, so now it's now we got to get a little bit more information. Oh, so we're learning new stuff on chapter Yes. And on the y-axis, we have reaction rate. Because when he messes up, Speaking of which, remember that time he messed up? Did you watch back the film on that? I haven't yet. It's not confirmed? No. Do you remember what day it was? No. It was the day we were up in uh, the other classroom upstairs. I'll listen. I'll listen. I'll listen to the playback. Okay. So now, now, how does this graph look? Is is there a positive relationship or a negative relationship between substrate concentration and reaction rate? This we we've, we've seen before. There's a positive, right? The more substrate you have, the faster the reaction is going to take place. Up until what? Vmax. Up until Vmax. So we've got something that looks like this, right? And we've got Vmax here, which is our maximum reaction rate. Yeah, we've got another cool thing. We've got what's called one half Vmax. Would you agree that this is one half of Vmax? It looks like a little bit of a graph, but you know, yeah. Yeah. Because why it's relevant is the x, the x uh, measurement, the point on the x-axis at which the reaction reaches one half the max is called Km, which stands for the Michaelis-Minton constant. And the reason why this is relevant is because we need to start talking about inhibition. When we start inhibiting the ability of an enzyme to carry out its activity. And I want to ask you this question. Why on earth would you ever want to inhibit an enzyme? So the reaction goes faster? What's that? So the reaction Well, if, the, if you inhibit the enzyme, the reaction is going to slow down, right? Because the enzyme is catalyzing that reaction. So if you inhibit the enzyme, the reaction's going to slow down. Does that make sense? Yeah. If, you, if you inhibit the enzyme, the reaction is going to slow down because the enzyme's catalyzing that reaction. Why would you ever want a reaction to slow down? Don't want it to happen. Why? Ray? Or it's too fast so you can't measure it. Okay, but if you're a cell, not... Oh. So yeah, I, I probably should ask this. Why would a cell want to inhibit an enzyme? Right, you're like... Well, it makes sense for us, like, we might need to characterize, um, you know, 
this reaction a little bit differently. But why would a cell want to inhibit the reaction? Yeah, Emma. Because the reaction has a negative effect. Maybe at a certain point, right? If you build up too much product, you may have too much of a good thing, right? Is too much of a good thing a bad thing? Uh, it can be. Yeah. Too, much too much water. Oh, yeah. No, you, can, you see the thing is you can't have too much chocolate because any amount of chocolate is too much chocolate, Ooh. right? Uh, Theoretically. All right. Define your term of good. You know. Yeah. So, oftentimes, the product of a reaction inhibits the enzyme that catalyzes the reaction. So, if there's too much of that product around, it will inhibit the enzyme from acting. Okay? And there's basically two ways that you can inhibit enzyme function. Okay? So this is inhibition. Write this down. This is good stuff. Inhibition. And I don't know if that's spelled right or not. It's close enough. Sound it out. So inhibition. This is when you want to weaken an enzyme. Okay, so in inhibition, you are going to weaken the enzyme, and the product often inhibits the enzyme. And we have a specific name for this. You're like, why? Let's just do the concept. Because it's a cool name. Okay, so the product of the reaction often inhibits the enzyme. And what we call this is negative feedback. Negative feedback. It's what would happen were I to give you a, uh, a, a survey about this course, right? Negative feedback. Nothing? I thought that was clever. Okay, so that we You're only getting positive feedback. When the product inhibits the enzyme, we call this negative feedback. So it's it's producing, it's it's helping to produce a product that then inhibits the enzyme from working. And this prevents a buildup of material within the cell. Okay? And and so a buildup of material, it could it could be that it, it's really too much of that that good thing is not really a bad thing, except for now it may impact water movement across the membrane, right? Because all solute, the overall solute concentration impacts which direction water moves, right? Water moves to where there's more solute. Okay, that makes sense? So inhibition, it's oftentimes inhibited by the product. We call that negative feedback. And again, there are two ways to inhibit an enzyme. Let me change colors. We have competitive inhibition, and we have, what do you think the other one's called? Non-competitive. Non Gosh, that was, that was great critical thinking. Okay, so we have competitive inhibition, and we have non-competitive inhibition. Okay. Competitive. What 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 is so this is whatever's inhibiting that enzyme is competing with something. And what on earth could it be competing with with regards to that enzyme? What does the enzyme bind to? Do you remember this this figure we had enzyme plus substrate, then you had enzyme, substrate, then you had enzyme, product, and then you had enzyme plus product, right? Do you remember this? Oh yeah, oh, yeah, yeah you've yeah. got that, and then of course we can complete that loop. So what does the enzyme bind to? Substrate. The substrate. So in competitive inhibition, what is the inhibitor, oftentimes the product, competing with? The substrate, okay? So the, the, the inhibitor is competing with the substrate. 
which means it binds to the enzyme in the same place. It binds to the enzyme in the same place as the substrate. Does that make sense? Because it's competing with the substrate for that enzyme. The way now in, in inhibition, you're going to you're going to you're going to see this play out. Now in competitive inhibition, you can still reach Vmax, but it's going to take you more material to get there. Yeah, you need to draw that blue line and mark that as competitive inhibition. So do you see that it lowered the reaction rate? Do you see that? It lowered the reaction rate relative to the non-inhibited enzyme. Do you see it? It's lower. The reaction rate is lower. Now, you can still get to Vmax, but what did you need? More substrate to overwhelm the inhibitor because it's competing with the substrate for that binding site. If you can overwhelm that with more substrate, you can overcome that inhibitor. Yeah? So blue one has more substrate, and the black one's like, like, What's that? Um, I mean, they're, they're both moving to the same substrate comp, uh, concentration, but do you see that the black one reaches Vmax earlier than the inhibited enzyme? Because it's not inhibited. It's reaching maximum reaction rate at a much lower substrate concentration. But now, in this example here, some of the enzymes are being blocked by the inhibitor. Right? Some of these enzymes are being blocked by the inhibitor. We get to a point in which we have way more substrate than inhibitor, and we, we basically are no longer inhibited. Right? Yeah, Emma. So the block, would you say like that's... I don't like the parent drop, I guess. Like yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Now, notice KM changed in competitive inhibition. Right? It required a higher substrate concentration to get to Vmax, one half of Vmax. Would you agree? Correct. Okay. Love it. Now let's look at non-competitive inhibition. So if it's non-competitive, what is that inhibitor not competing with? It's no longer competing with the substrate, which means substrate concentration has no impact on that inhibition. The inhibition is going to happen basically regardless of substrate competition because it's not competing with the substrate, which means it's probably not binding in the same place the substrate is. Does that make sense? Because if it were, then it's competing with the substrate. But if it binds to that enzyme somewhere else and changes the chemistry or the shape of that enzyme, then it's not competing with substrate. It's just inhibiting the enzyme. And so we get something that looks like this. We get a new Vmax. So in non-competitive inhibition, we get a new Vmax. Now our Vmax, in this case, it just happened to be one half Vmax. It doesn't have to be, but that's, I made it that, okay? But in non-competitive inhibition, you get a new Vmax. It doesn't matter how much substrate you give, you are not going to get back to the original Vmax because your inhibitor is not competing with the substrate for the same binding site. It's binding that enzyme somewhere else. Does that make sense? A yeah. little bit of sense, a lot of sense. You're like, man, I love this. Do you feel like you could answer a question on the AP exam where you could look at a graph and look at the inhibition and tell them whether it's competitive or non-competitive? I wish I could. I probably yeah. Because in competitive, you can overwhelm it and get back to Vmax by having a lot of substrate, right? Because the inhibitor is competing with the substrate. So if you have a lot of it, it's just going to win, right? It's like... Listen, I'm way, way stronger than my children, right? It makes sense. They're seven, five, and three. But if, if you had 500 seven-year-olds all fighting against me, I don't know how that would work because I'm not that big, but you could just overwhelm the system. Trinity. Um, is there, still a plan for the there is, and it's the same. In non-competitive inhibition, your, your KM does not change. Because look at this. I didn't draw the graph great, but this would be our one half Vmax, our new Vmax. 
Well, we have one half of the original VMAX. This is one half of the new VMAX. And so KM, and it, my graph, it's, it's, not, it's not perfect. It's not intersecting at exactly the right place. But your KM, your Michaelis-Minton constant, is, does not change in non-competitive inhibition. Your Vmax changes, your Km or your substrate concentration in which you reach one half of Vmax does not change. In competitive inhibition it does. Your Km gets larger. Okay? So you think you could look at a graph like this and you can tell what type of inhibition is happening? Okay. Now, so somebody explain to me as far as the binding site is concerned, the difference between competitive and non-competitive inhibition. Where does the inhibitor bind in competitive? Where does the inhibitor bind in non-competitive? Competitive is binds to substrate. Binds to the same place as the substrate in competitive inhibition, and that's why it's competitive. They're competing for the same place on the enzyme. What about non-competitive? It's not binding at the same place. It's binding somewhere else that's changing the enzyme. Okay. All right, any questions about this? No. Now, you can have a very similar idea. Notice over here, I've been doing this, I, I don't know, our last maybe seven or eight classes. I don't know if you've noticed it. I've been yeah. writing the agenda. It helps me stay on track. I don't know if it helps you. It helps you to see, man, how much more is he going to try to cover? <laughs> We've only got like seven minutes, and there are still eight points on the board. Um, but notice the thing that comes next, I don't know if you can read this in the back because it's small, I can barely read it from here, it's activation. And so the thing is some enzymes, so this inhibition, this is assuming the enzyme at default is in its active state, right? The enzyme at default is in its active state. But what about if the enzyme in its default is in an inactive state? then activation works in a similar way to inhibition, except for the activator is always going to be at a separate site from the where the substrate binds, okay? The activator is always going to be at a separate site because you can't activate the enzyme by binding where the substrate's gonna bind because then the substrate can't bind, right? That's not an activated enzyme. That make sense? Okay, so we call this um, I, I've been, we've been talking about binding where the substrate binds or binding somewhere else. We need a name for that somewhere else, right? Because otherwise we're just going to call it somewhere else. What's wrong with that? I don't like that. So we've got, in this one, the competitive, we call that the binding site. And that's where the enzyme binds the substrate. It's the binding site. And that's where that competitive inhibitor binds, at the binding site. The non-competitive inhibitor, it binds at what's called the allosteric site. Allosteric site. Allosteric site. Can you see that? A-L-L-O-S-T-E-R-I-C. Man, everybody listening to this recording, I want to apologize on behalf of the chapel band yeah. for ruining the last 30 minutes of our class. Okay, so binding site, allosteric site. So what do you think is another name for a non-competitive inhibitor? Allosteric inhibitor. Man, that's great critical thinking. <laughs> Man, you guys are on point this morning. A little talkative, but less so than before we went on break. And just, just on point. I love it. I love it. Okay? So binding site. Non-competitive inhibitors bind to the allosteric site. These are sometimes referred to as allosteric inhibitors. All right? It's just somewhere else on the enzyme. It could be on the exact opposite side of the enzyme, but it's just somewhere that's not the binding site. All right? So now you've noticed we've accomplished everything on our agenda for today. Yes? Where's the graph? What's that? What was thermo? Oh, the thermodynamics? That was where we just, yeah. Boy. Yeah. Okay. We've got about, we've got about eight minutes left of class. And I, I want to give you an option for what we're going to do with those eight minutes. 
Do you want to work through where I give you some examples and you talk about what type of inhibition or talk about the thermodynamics or alternatively, I know you're shaking your head because alternatively you are thinking like maybe we just sit quietly and relax. It's not one of the options. The other option is that we start in on chapter nine. I'd rather not. I know because by the time we get into it, we're going to be done with this. So I, think, I think we should. Dude, add we can accomplish an incredible amount in seven minutes. I, think I, think we do a third I could probably, I could teach you, you, we're going to move on to chapter nine. I'm going to show you how much I can accomplish in <laughs> seven minutes. Thank you, Rick. The challenge accepted. <laughs> We love when people give you choices, but then they choose for you. <laughs> well, I wasn't going to choose for you. I wasn't going to choose for you. And and really, Rick chose for you by challenging how much I can accomplish in seven minutes. Is idea. All right. So chapter nine. So in your notes, go ahead and... Uh, you know, put chapter 8 to the side for a while. <laughs> Chapters 9 and 10 are all, are all basically asking the question, so what? Okay? So, so chapter 8, we know how enzymes work, right? They lower the activation energy. They, they speed up the rate of reaction. Chapters 9 and 10, they're like, so what? Let's see it in practice. And so chapter 9 is all about cellular respiration. Cellular respiration. I'm going to try to get you two pages of notes in the last in the last six minutes. This talk is a, is a minute. Slow. This is uh, if it's not, it should be cellular respiration. Okay, the overall reaction for cellular respiration is this. Uh, we'll go ahead and do this. C6 H12 O6 plus oxygen produces carbon dioxide and water. And as far as this is in balance, so we'll balance this chemical equation thusly. And so this is typically the reaction provided to describe what is going on in cellular respiration. But I want you to know this, and you'll see this as we go through chapter nine. We can respirate using far more than just this sugar. And this sugar would typically be glucose, although there are many sugars that would have this same formula. Uh, glucose, uh, galactose, I think maltose has the same one. Fructose has this same chemical formula. Okay, so there, there, we can respirate using far more than just glucose using this reaction, except two of our cells. Two cells in our body, this is the only way they can respirate. This is the only way they can respirate. And those are called neurons and red blood cells. Well, I think we've mentioned this before. So there are two cells in our body that this is the only form of respiration that they do. Every other cell in our body, this could be basically any carbon-containing material. What well, has to contain carbon, hydrogen, carbon and hydrogen, so we can, we can carry out a combustion reaction. So if you remember back to your chemistry, this is a combustion reaction, right? Something reacting in the presence of oxygen to produce carbon dioxide and water, this is a combustion reaction. But this is happening in a very controlled way, right? You're not just lighting the glucose on fire inside of your cells. That would be fun. That would be fun. This is pretty awesome, but that's not what happens. Okay, so neurons and red blood cells, this is the only type of respiration that they have. Okay? And because of that, we learn, when you learn cellular respiration, you learn it just with glucose first, and then you start learning it with how the, all of these other steps come in. Okay? I need to erase this because I need more space. Too much stuff. I know, too much stuff. Not enough space. Rick, Rick didn't think we can accomplish very much in seven minutes. Okay? So cellular respiration, you have two types of cellular respiration. You have aerobic and aerobic. And anaerobic, absolutely. Anaerobic. And the difference is what? This right here, this is aerobic respiration. Aerobic means in the presence of oxygen. Oh my 
my goodness. Man, Kyle, you are killing it. <laughs> this was like back when we were talking about um, paleontology and Mark was killing it, right? It's like you all, ha- you all have your little niche of stuff you... Well, you have, you've only asked one question today. I don't know what's wrong. Is everything okay? Yeah, watch your side. Okay, you're sick? Okay. So, shh. Aerobic respiration happens in the presence of oxygen. This right here is aerobic respiration, and it takes place in three steps. Step one is called glycolysis. The splitting of the glucose. The splitting of the sugar is what it means, but yeah, in this case it's glucose. Glycolysis, the splitting of the sugar. Step two is called the Krebs cycle. Krebs or TCA or citric acid. Okay, so that's step two. The Krebs, the TCA, the citric acid, it's all the same thing. Just different names for the same cycle. Okay, and then the third step. Anyone? Is it another cycle? Calvin cycle. <laughs> no, Calvin cycle is uh, photosynthesis, but we'll get there. So this is called oxidative. Oxidative <laughs> phosphorylation, or another name for it, phosphorylation. Or, sometimes you'll see it referred to as the electron transport chain. Oh, yeah. Transport chain. I remember learning something. Okay, so oxidative phosphorylation or the electron transport chain. Transport. Okay, now, this reaction produces between 32 and 34 ATP in your average human cell, okay? This reaction releases or produces between 32 and 34 ATP. Check this out. Well, first we need to do anaerobic. So you got that 32 to 34 ATP? Yeah. Okay. Anaerobic respiration, there's only one, well, actually there are two. There's one, step one is glycolysis. And then step two is fermentation. Okay, there are two steps in that, glycolysis and fermentation. Did I get, I didn't get two pages of notes, did I? Oh, man. Told you. It'd be like But did we cover more than you expected we could, Rick? 